of fuel to get to the finish. Paul Menard, his family with such a long racing history at Indianapolis, they'll kiss the bricks together now. Fourth win in the Brickyard 400 to Jimmy Johnson. Opportunity for Ryan Newman's team here after the slow stop from Johnson's determined driving from Jeff Gordon. God, I finally had to reach out of my life. NASCAR's first five-time winner of the Brickyard 400. Five wins at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Incredible. Joey Logano chasing down the 18. Kyle Busch is going to add his name to the illustrious list of Brickyard 400 winners. The list of surprise poll winners for the Brickyard 400 added a new name in 2011 as second-generation Georgia driver David Reagan scored just his second career pole position dressed in a blue and white wheeled Ned Jarrett throwback livery. Jimmy Johnson's pursuit for a fourth Brickyard title started from third on the grid, while the driver that dominated the last two times at Indy, Juan Pablo Montoya, rolled from seventh and Jeff Gordon from eighth. When the race started, outside pole center Casey Kane grabbed the lead, but the driver that was steamrolling to the front was Gordon, who quickly passed cars to get towards the front and eventually the lead. I think Jeff Gordon has the best looking car early on here. There goes Jeff, man, he's still on the move. Has that thing out front, that looks like maybe the best car here today. Gordon led laps in the middle portions of the race along with Matt Kenseth, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Brad Keselowski. An innocent enough looking debris caution came out with 45 laps to go. But it was that yellow that started to shape the end of the race. On the first lap after the restart, Landon Castle spun, sweeping up Casey Kane, bringing out another yellow. During those two caution periods, different pit strategies were played by crew chiefs up and down pit road. That then created a restart with 34 laps to go, just beyond a standard fuel window which sparked a bit of a strange sequence. Many leaders took the green flag on the restart and only ran five to eight laps before pitting at the top end of a fuel window to make their final stops. Tony Stewart then took the lead, but had to pit for fuel with 15 laps to go. That turned the lead over to a group of drivers that had been running slowly since the beginning of the run to try to save fuel. Drivers included were Paul Menard, Mark Martin, Regan Smith, Daytona 500 winner Trevor Bain, and defending race winner Jamie McMurray. Among the drivers that were leading that had stopped for fuel, Gordon was the leader. And with fresher tires and enough fuel to make the finish, he charged hard to try to make up the gap that was nearly 20 seconds to start, then trimmed to 10 and 5 until Gordon was in striking distance. Audibly, you can hear these guys slowing down into turn one. It's a slow pace for the race lead. Bernard's gonna try and keep McMurray behind him, manage the pace to see if he can get to the finish, and manage that gap back to Gordon and the others. With eight laps to go in the drama building, McMurray finessed his way past Menard to take the lead. Jeff Gordon is ninth. 7.7 .7 seconds back, McMurray goes to the lead. Eight laps to go, the defending winner is out in front. Gordon was flying, lapping nearly two seconds a lap faster than the driver saving fuel. This could turn into a wild last lap. There could be people running out of gas and a guy charging to try and catch them all. With four laps to go and Gordon getting ever closer, crew chief slugger Labby keyed the radio and told Menard to go. Go ahead, go. We're turning loose. 24 is two seconds faster. We can't give up. Okay, the race is on here, guys. Here yeah. goes Paul. That was his radio. He was told to go. He's gone to the lead. Paul Menard. Gordon was there. He soared past Smith and then McMurray in just a few hundred feet, then went after Martin for second. Jeff Gordon should be able to get by Mark Martin here shortly. If he doesn't have to waste any time getting by Mark, and he's not at all before they get to turn three. This is Jeff Gordon's race to win right now. To second place. He not only has more fuel and enough, he has fresher tires than Paul Menard to run these quick laps. These fans at Indianapolis are all on their feet trying to see if the young man who made his racing name on the short tracks of this area can win a fifth Brickyard 400. Paul Menard leads, Gordon is second, two laps to go. 
now it was one spot and two laps that separated Gordon from a historic fifth win, but it was still Paul Menard holding the lead and holding the hopes of a long family line of racing at Indianapolis. In his 167th career start, Menard, running on fumes, was desperately close to his first career win and doing it at the greatest race course in the world. In true Indianapolis fashion, the white flag waved and the whole speedway held its breath, anticipating the finish as Alan Bestwick brilliantly painted the picture of the end with masterful strokes. Coming to the white flag. Drive the hell out of it, come on. One lap to go to win the Brickyard Menard dealing with lap traffic. Oh, trying to close in turn one. Menard is cleared out. Oh, he's got to deal with the traffic. Looks good so far. This is going to be the biggest day of Paul Menard's life. But does he have enough fuel to get to the finish? Gordon clear of traffic. Setting up for the finish. Final corners. Good corner here. 30-year-old Paul Menard, his family with such a long racing history in Indianapolis, they'll kiss the bricks together now. Paul Menard wins the Brickyard 400. Wow. Paul Menard stunned NASCAR and the Brickyard by becoming the first driver to claim his first career win in the Brickyard 400. Gordon, with the best car in the field, came so close to a fifth win, but had to settle for second. The 2012 Brickyard 400 started with Denny Hamlin leading the first 26 laps from pole. Jimmy Johnson started sixth and quickly moved up to second, and then picked up the lead after the first set of green flag pit stops. The first 100 miles of the race went caution free until Travis Quaffle hit the wall. Johnson wasted no time getting the lead back off the restart and stretched his advantage until the next run of pit stops when he lost the lead to Brad Keselowski. A lap 101 restart had Keselowski as the leader, with Regan Smith on an alternative strategy to his outside, and Johnson right behind in third. Oh, Keselowski loose under Smith. Johnson goes by him, side by side with Smith for the lead. Keselowski's slip allowed Johnson to blast to the lead, while Keselowski backslid all the way to ninth. Johnson put the hammer down and extended his lead until a debris caution flew on lap 126. Greg Biffle led on the restart, but it only took four laps for Johnson to zoom on by and retake his lead. Here comes Jimmy Johnson, and there he goes. Then, just a couple of laps later, the first major accident of the day took place in turn one. Oh, Joey Logano in trouble, turn one. And here we go. Matt Kenseth just talked about how he was struggling in some of the heavy racing since the restart. And now the NASCAR Spring Cup Championship leaders got fire coming from under his car. Johnson and Biffle lined up on the front row with Kyle Busch just behind for the key restart. Johnson got a great jump and left Biffle and Busch to battle side by side for second, once again allowing Johnson to pull free. He was easily the best car all day as he led 99 of the 160 laps, and Jimmy Johnson drove into the history books with a record-equaling fourth Brickyard 400 win. Johnson said you come through the tunnel and history starts talking to you, and he's so happy to have had three special moments for himself at this track. He said, I hope to have a fourth. His hero, Rick Mears, won the Indianapolis 500 four times. They've got something to talk about as Johnson clears the final corner and the checkered flag is in the air. A fourth win in the Brickyard 400 to Jimmy Johnson. It was known as the Johnson years in NASCAR in that era. He won five straight series championships from 2006 to 2010, and now he had won his fourth Brickyard 400 in just a seven-year span. He had followed in the footsteps of his childhood hero, Rick Mears, and his mentor and car owner, Jeff Gordon, by capturing four Indianapolis wins. 
And now the chase was on to become the first driver to ever win at the famous oval five times. The NASCAR Cup Series came back to the Brickyard in July of 2013 for the 20th running of the Brickyard 400, with Johnson entering in again as the favorite, in no small part because the team brought back the same car that performed so dominantly the year before. With many anticipating a historic fifth win from Johnson, it was the 48 car that sat on the provisional pole on qualifying day. With only one final run to be made, Indiana native Ryan Newman, one of the best qualifiers of his generation, rolled onto the track. Can he hang on? It'll be close. Newman or Johnson? Checkered flag. Oh, I did it. Newman, the last driver to run. New track record. Ryan Newman does it. Not only was it a new track record, it was the first time a stock car made an official lap at the Speedway under 48 seconds at a staggering 187 and a half miles per hour. As Newman came back to pit road, he was congratulated by team owner and fellow Hoosier Tony Stewart and a tearful father, Greg. Yeah, and tears in the eyes of his dad when he leaned in that window. A big handshake from uh, Tony Stewart and Jimmy Johnson. What's it mean to be from Indiana and be on the pole at the Brickyard 400? I'll admit I was emotional. For me, it's special because it's the Brickyard. I hadn't won a pole here before, and I won so many poles. Um, but it had been so long. It's been so long since I won a pole. It's like uh, people ask me if I ran out of fuel for the Rockets, you know, that type of thing. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's special for me uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, being home, being in Indiana, being in the Brickyard, and being so long, uh, not winning a pole, so. So it was Newman and Johnson to lead the field to the start of the race, and it was those two that would hold on to front running positions for the balance of the afternoon. Newman led the first 29 laps, but Johnson grabbed the lead after pit stops on lap 31 and led 55 of the next 62 laps while other drivers like Joey Logano, Jeff Gordon, and Brad Keselowski floated to the front during pit stop cycles. It was truly a day-long duel between Newman and Johnson. Only three cautions flew the entire day, keeping the field strung out and allowing Newman and Johnson to fight for the lead between themselves. Johnson led by a little over a second as he came to pit road for his final stop with 27 laps to go. Here comes Jimmy down for the final time of the day. What a dominating performance with Jimmy with the same car he used to lead 99 laps and win this race a year ago. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Got it full of fuel. 17 second stop for Jimmy Johnson. Johnson's 17 plus second stop opened the door for Newman to reclaim the lead if the 39 team could complete a quick stop. Opportunity for Ryan Newman's team here after the slow stop from Johnson's. Newman pits from the lead. What'll be 26 laps to go when he crosses the start finish line. And you guys are right, that was the call on the 39. It was a quick stop, it was clean. They made a track bar adjustment to help the tight condition, right sides, and they filled it up to make it home. After Johnson's slow stop, combined with Matt Borland choosing to put just two tires on the 39 car, Newman went from nearly two seconds behind Johnson to seven seconds ahead. Once the pit cycle was completed, Newman had the lead with under 10 laps to go. And even with having just two fresh tires, the clean air advantage Newman had was too much for Johnson. And the white flag will be in the air. One more lap to victory lane for Ryan Newman. White flag clear out the back. If he can make it back around, it'll be a hugely popular win with the local Indiana fans. A race-long duel between Newman and Jimmy Johnson. Coming to the checkered flag right here, man. Thank you, guys. This is amazing. Amazing weekend. Ryan Newman wins the Brickyard oh, 400. Man. Newman was the winner of the 2008 Daytona 500, but for the South Bend native and Purdue University graduate, this was the biggest win of his career. This is, uh, this is a dream come true for me. I can't wait to get over and push my lips against those bricks. Brian, you grew up two and a half hours north of here in South Bend, Indiana. The Indy 500, you grew up watching it. Your whole family's here. Your dad was spotting for you. Your wife's here with your two beautiful daughters. What does it mean to look around and stand right here? I don't, I don't realize it yet. It's a dream come true. I don't think it can, it, 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 if it hits you all at once, it's not good enough. It'll take a week or so for this to set in. And
2014 was yet another year with big change in NASCAR's top tier series. The season ending chase for the championship was changed to a 16 driver elimination style tournament, putting more emphasis on winning races. There was also a newer and faster package putting less downforce in the cars, picking the speeds up massively at every track. The same could be said when the series came to Indianapolis in late July. The two best drivers throughout the first half of the season was easily Kevin Harvick and Jeff Gordon. Harvick was in his first season in a new ride for Stuart Haas Racing and already had two wins and four poles, while Gordon had one win and six top five finishes, which put him on top of the championship standings. As was usually the case with Indianapolis, the cream rose to the top. Harvick shattered the old track record set by Newman just a year prior by exploding a lap at 188 and a half miles per hour, while Gordon qualified second. The green flag waved and Harvick led the first lap, but Gordon wasn't willing to give him the second. Harvick will lead lap one, but here comes Gordon to his inside. Gordon's shown strength all weekend long, qualified on the front row and now taking the lead by yeah, Kevin Harvick. Yeah. Due to overnight rain, a competition caution was brought out on lap 22. Not everyone stopped under the yellow period, and Joey Logano grabbed the top spot. After the restart, Casey Kane started to reel Logano in and showed his muscle by taking the lead. Gordon got back by Kane in the first set of green flag stops, but Denny Hamlin was playing a different strategy and stayed out longer to gain the lead. By the time Hamlin came to pit road, Harvick had weaved through some traffic and passed Gordon putting the pole sitter back in front of the field. The second caution of the race waved when Danica Patrick's engine expired on lap 69, catching some drivers a lap down, like Kurt Busch, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and Brad Keselowski. Kane took the lead on the restart as Gordon and Harvick got boxed in by Toyota teammates Hamlin and Kyle Busch. The sun started to poke out from the clouds on lap 75, and the track started to change character. Gordon struggled in dirty air, but worked hard to get by Logano and Harvick around the halfway point. On an alternative strategy for most of the race, Hamlin pitted from second with 70 laps to go, earlier than the other leaders were willing to stop. Caution number three was triggered on lap 98 when Trevor Bain crashed on the inside of turn three, which appeared to be a big break for Hamlin. But as it turned out, the number 11 had to come back down pit road with everyone else under the caution because the team didn't get the car full of fuel when they pitted under green. Clint Boyer stayed out under the yellow and restarted as the leader, but fell back instantly as Kane powered back to the lead with Kyle Busch in behind. Gordon was in danger of losing multiple positions on the restart, but made a bold outside move to stay ahead of Logano and keep hold of fifth. Then he made quick work of Boyer, Harvick, and Bush to get to second and set his sights on Kane for the final 50 laps. Kane was the first of the leaders to pit for the final time with 33 laps to go, just on the fringe of a fuel window. Gordon pitted the next lap, and on the blend, they came out right together. Kane's team was concerned about whether he could make it the distance on fuel or not, but he was unable to save any as Gordon was glued to his bumper cover for eight consecutive laps until a caution came out for Ryan Truex stopping on the track. This gave Kane an opportunity to save fuel under the yellow as the top seven cars stayed on the track, not wanting to give up track position. With Kane shutting off the engine to save fuel under caution, he was unable to clean his tires as well as he wanted, but he had the preferred inside line for the restart with his teammate Gordon to his outside, knowing that if he was going to win a historic fifth Brickyard 400, he needed to make it happen now. How important is the restart considering you've had a couple of stumbles at the restart today? The restart's gonna be the race, really. I think we might be able to get, be able to pass Casey if we get out behind him, but if we lose more than that, it's over. 17 laps to go at the Brickyard. Jeff Gordon's really going to have to take the lead from Casey Kane because if he doesn't, he's probably going back to at least third. He did it! And it's Kane that goes 
goes back to third and maybe fourth. Just as it was in 2005, Casey Kane led on a late restart at Indianapolis, only to be overtaken by a legend of the sport to deny him of a crowning win. It was Gordon in front with just 16 laps to go, and Kyle Busch was now second. With clean air on the nose of his Chevrolet, Gordon started to pull away a little bit every lap. And now as the laps clicked down, a grand piece of unreached history was on the tips of a Golden Warrior sword. It was 20 years ago when Gordon, age 23, was the prodigy, the anointed one, that lived out a childhood dream by becoming the first NASCAR driver to win at Indianapolis. Four years later, Wonder Boy was the first to win a second Brickyard 400, a feat still today that's only been accomplished by five other drivers, and he wasn't done yet. He was the first to win a third, greatness personified, and then the first to win four. At this point, the word legend fell short. In time, the young buck he hand chose to follow in his footsteps would be the only one to match. Now at the age of 43, he still wasn't done raising the bar. Pittsburgh, Indiana's Jeff Gordon, an all-time great, an already fabled storybook hero, was ready to rise and meet the faces of racing's gods and taunt them. He's in the last lap. And as we look out the window across at the grandstands, all the fans that are here at the Speedway today are now on their feet watching to see if Jeff Gordon comes back around to take another checkered flag. Final quarters. He won the first one in 1994. 20 years later, he wins the 21st checkered flag in the Brickyard 400 to Jeff Gordon. Only the best of the best had run and won on racing's ultimate proving ground for over a century. At the time, only five men in history had ever won at the Mecca of Motorsports four times, but no one had ever won a fifth. His mountainous legacy now had the ultimate prize. Five wins at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Incredible. NASCAR's first five-time winner of the Brickyard 400. How does it feel to be back in victory lane at Indianapolis? I don't think there's a greater feeling as a race car driver and a race team, because that's what it took today. Total team effort to be here in Victory Lane uh, in Indianapolis. Yeah, I'm not very good on restarts and wasn't very good today. And I finally made the restart of my life today when it counted most. And I knew we had a great race car. We just need to get out front. You certainly are one who understands the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What's the significance to you to be a five-time winner here? I was trying so hard with 10 to go not to focus on the crowd. I could see every once in a while glance up there and see the reaction. I was trying not to let it get to me, not think about it too much. And uh, yet you can't help it. It's such a big race, such an important victory, crucial moment in the, in the, in the season and championship. And you know, you just, those emotions take over. I have my kids here, oh my God, there's nothing better than coming to Victory Lane, especially in one of the biggest races with your family here. This one really is for all those fans throughout the years and, and all weekend long, they're saying, we believe you can get number five. Go get number five. We got number five, yes! Words failed to describe the feat. Put simply, Jeff Gordon was officially the greatest driver at the greatest race course in the world, joining an exclusive club of one as a five-time winner at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. After winning his fifth Brickyard 400, Jeff Gordon went on to have a strong finish to the 2014 season. But after narrowly missing out on his fifth championship, Gordon announced in the offseason that 2015 would be his final full-time season of his legendary career. It was an emotional pre-race as Gordon got ready for his last Brickyard 400 from the 19th starting spot. Carl Edwards won the pole, but it was Joey Logano who got back to the yard of bricks first to complete lap one, just the second time in race history that the pole sitter did not lead the first lap. Edwards did get back to the lead, however, on lap 12 and led the next 20. 
Kevin Harvick picked up the lead through the first cycle of pit stops and then traded it on and off with Logano. The first caution of the race came out on lap 46 for a balloon on the racetrack. That innocent looking caution created an unfortunate sequence of events. The ensuing restart saw drivers going three and four wide on the way to turn three, which was only going to lead to disaster. Two by two, three and four. Oh, and around goes a 15. Clint Boyer spinning through the short shoot. Also caught up Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon with a lot of damage. I don't think Clint Boyer had any damage at all. I'm not sure he ever hit anything, but Jeff Gordon had a lot of contact. He's, uh, you know, I think his chances to win today are gone. In his 22nd and final Brickyard 400 start, Jeff Gordon got caught up in a crash, just the third crash of his Indianapolis career, ending any competitive hopes of his race. He finished 42nd, the worst finish of his Brickyard 400 career. Kevin Harvick held the lead off the restart and led 50 of the next 59 laps. A lap 121 caution for a Brian Scott crash brought the field down pit road for a crucial set of pit stops. Leader Harvick took four tires and got jumped by five cars as Kyle Busch, Martin Truex Jr. and Danica Patrick took just two tires, while others stayed out knowing they couldn't go the rest of the way on fuel. Brad Keselowski owned the lead and held onto the top spot until a caution came out for debris dropped by Trevor Bain with 20 laps to go. Keselowski was forced to pit under the yellow, giving up the lead to Harvick, who took the green with Edwards alongside. Edwards got loose in turn one while underneath Logano and fell out of contention. At the end of the first lap off the restart, Dale Earnhardt Jr. spun in turn one, triggering another yellow. With eight to go, Harvick was again the control car for the restart and chose the outside lane just as he had on the previous restart. But this time, it was Kyle Busch with him on the front row. Kevin Harvick on the outside, Kyle Busch on the inside, green flag back in the air, eight to go. Bush with a great restart. He's going to try to take the lead, and he will take it away from Kevin Harvick before they get out of turn one. 22 and 18 did a much better job of getting hooked up and pushing. What an incredible restart by the 18 of Kyle Bush. He's back out in front at the Brickyard. Bush powered his way to the front, but his lead was erased with another debris caution with just five laps left. Bush got another great restart as Harvick spun the tires and dropped back, allowing Logano to charge forward to get alongside Bush in turn one. But behind them, Trevor Bain crashed hard to bring out yet another yellow and force overtime. It was now two longtime foes, Bush and Logano, on the front row for the overtime restart as Bush aimed for a third straight win and first at the Brickyard, while Logano was gunning for Roger Penske's first win as a car owner at the track where he had so much success in the 500. The green flag waved with darkening skies in the background, and Bush blasted into the first corner to hold the lead, but Logano stayed locked in on the back bumper of the 18. He's all over the back bumper as they come into turn number three. Joey Logano chasing down the 18 of Kyle Busch. White flag in the air. One more time around the Brickyard. Into three. The gap closed just a bit by Joey Logano. Right back into the gas through the short shoot. Into turn four. Now all Kyle Busch is going to see will be the flag stand. Fans on either side. Kyle Busch is going to add his name to the illustrious list of Brickyard 400 winners. Bush had missed the first handful of races of the 2015 season with a broken leg and foot from a crash in February at Daytona. Now his comeback was complete with the biggest win of his career at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, taking the Joe Gibbs number 18 car back to Brickyard 400 victory for the first time in 15 years following the footsteps of Bobby Labonte. Next time on the final episode of 30 Years of Thrills in History, the history of the Brickyard 400, we'll wrap up the races from 2016 to 2020 and NASCAR's decision to take away a crown jewel race following the 2020 season. Until then, I'm Matthew Owens. Thank you for joining us. 
Yeah, you know, I've been coming here since I was a little kid, and uh, my dad's been trying to win this race for 35 years, and so this is this is for my dad, uh, Brett Tooney, back home. A lot of emotions right now, but these guys, you know, Slugger Lab, and all these guys just do a hell of a job, and um, man, it's, I can't believe we won Indy.